All right, we are recording this meeting, and Tom, introduce yourself. I will do so. Hold on one, just share screen. Confirm that you're uh, seeing my share screen, okay? Starting to come in. Here it is. Everybody getting that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, feel free to interrupt if I'm taking too long or boring you or whatever, but here goes. Uh, my name's Tom Pereira and I'm W1TP, and I'm going to take you back to my first Radio Shack in New York City. My parents had a lot of money, so I was able to buy a lot of stuff. This is how it looked in 1954, and that's how I sort of got interested, and that was right after World War II and spy radios and radios were really available easily on Cortland Street in New York City in Radio Row. So I just picked out and had a wonderful time with that. Let's go and look at what happens when a, a country is occupied. In this case, we're looking at a German occupation of a country. And when the country is occupied, the citizens divide up into three categories. Uh, there are citizens who do nothing, and that's the most citizens. Some of the citizens become collaborators with the invaders, and these are traitors, and they engage in spying on the third group of citizens that are the resistance. These are the patriots, these are involved in active fighting and spying, and their job is to report back to uh, the, um, in the um, allies what is going on in the country and to get news about what the allies are planning so that they can um, activate uh, destructive strategies uh, against the invading Germans. Now, most of the resistance people are not radio operators. So you have to get radio operators by way of a parachute drop. And most of the radio operators in World War II were British trained clandestine spy radio operator. So we'll go through this and uh, take a look. Here's a bunch of resistance fighters. You can uh, see they have to be trained in everything that they can be trained in, not usually in radio operations. Look at this guy down here. The first time he's seen the machine gun, the expression on his face is pretty uh, amazing. You have to realize that in a short time, that very same guy is going to be up there holding that machine gun and shooting at Germans. So it's a pretty uh, extraordinary time here. Resistance fighters placing bombs. And one of the jobs of the resistance is to take pictures. And here's a lady. Uh, the Germans didn't look very closely at women. And they could easily put a, a camera in their pocketbook and take pictures of what was going on. And there were other clandestine cameras that were used for taking pictures. Here's a guy uh, taking pictures while he lights his cigarette with a camera built into a cigarette lighter. Some of the resistance fighters took pretty extreme measures. This guy was protesting the rationing of clothes by the Germans by not wearing any. <laughs> Clandestine radio receivers were the uh, bread and butter of the resistance. They used those to find out what the allies were planning and what was going on with the war. But the penalty for having one of these receivers was death and therefore they had to be well hidden. Here's a radio hidden inside a suitcase. And here are some typical ways of hiding your radio. There's a look at the top, you see a, a, an electric iron, a furniture leg and a telephone book. And on the lower slide, you can see that the, ray, the iron and the chair leg and the telephone book have built in radios. Here are two phonographs that have been modified. So they look like phonographs on the left. And when you take out the platter, they are indeed spy radios on the right, receivers. Uh, another example, uh, a brownie box camera with a radio built inside and a a thermos bottle with a radio built inside. And they, there were no miniature components in those days, as you can see. Here's one of the most extreme examples. Uh, this is a radio set, crystal radio set, built into a dental appliance. Uh, take, making use of a very interesting physiological phenomenon, whereby if you impose an electrical signal in your mouth, you can actually hear the signal. 
Uh, for instance, if you took a loudspeaker lead and put it in your mouth, you could hear the uh, signal coming into the loudspeaker. Don't try it because many loudspeakers have high voltage coming in, but just an interesting phenomenon. This is the most popular of the radio receivers called the Sweetheart receiver made by the tens of thousands and parachuted into occupied Europe during the war. They're now very, very valuable selling for three to $5,000 each, but uh, the resistance used these. Sometimes they had to hide them inside a clock and very often they would sit together and listen to what was going on during the war. Some resistance fighters showing their, that in action. Now Germany, the German people were also supplied with radios, but they were special radios called Volksempfänger. Uh, like the Volkswagen, the people's car, this was the Volks radio receiver. And Fanger stands for, stands for receiver in German. And these receivers were widely distributed throughout Germany so that people could listen to the Fuhrer and listen to German patriotic music. But they came with a red label that you see in the bottom here that said, if you listen to anything else besides the Fuhrer and patriotic music, uh, you could be uh, subject to a death penalty. So people were pretty careful about that. But just to be sure, the Germans would occasionally transmit a tone on the BBC radio broadcast. And that tone would come through the Volksempfänger loudspeaker if people were listening to the BBC. And in the war, your neighbors would turn you in if they heard that tone. So you had to be really, really careful because a death penalty is nothing to fool around with. The spy radio operators were called pianists because they uh, played the telegraph key like you would play the piano key. And again, the penalty was instant death if they were caught. Here we see some soon to be pianists being trained in England uh, with a typical spy radio set in the foreground here. Uh, they were outfitted with appropriate uniforms or clothing. Everything had to be appropriate for being a European citizen rather than coming from England. And so they had extensive wardrobes to outfit the pianists with. The uh, radios were packed very carefully in uh, shockproof boxes and dropped by parachute. And here we see a couple of about to be pianists climbing into an airplane with their parachutes. They're going to open those parachutes at night over uh, France and parachute down and uh, uh, find their radio and set it up. And when they do that, they start sending messages back to uh, the allies in Europe. And uh, the uh, operators uh, looked in various ways. Here's a guy with a typical suitcase radio. What do you do for an antenna? Well, typically they'd run the antenna up inside a chimney where it couldn't be seen and it would be a vertical so it would get out fairly well. If you put up anything outside the houses, those um, uh, collaborators that I mentioned were always looking for antennas and they'd turn you in. So that's not a good thing. Uh, another um, um, pianist that in action. Here's a, a woman, very famous pianist named Paulette, codename Paulette. Her real name is Phyllis Doyle. And at 23, she parachuted into Germany, looking like she did on the left there. And uh, she would send coded messages to the allies for about half an hour and then run away as far away and as fast as they could, knowing that the German direction finding teams would locate her and find her if, uh, if she didn't get the heck out of there in a hurry. Here she is with her suitcase radio and some parts of the suitcase radio were small enough to fit into things like vacuum cleaners. They had to be very carefully hidden. Here's another pianist with her suitcase radio. And uh, if you couldn't uh, uh, plug it into the mains power supply, the, the local electric current, you had to generate your own power and they would often convert bicycles and an automobile generator to generate power for these radio. The radio sets are neat because they could run on six volts, 12 volts, 24 volts, 110 volts, 220 volts. Uh, it didn't matter what you fed them in, in terms of power. Often the messages that the spies were sending uh, were sent to them in various clandestine ways, such as the loaf of spoiled bread that you see on the right. 
these radios are extremely heavy because of the transformer that uh, had to be capable of all those different voltages. And so it, it looks sort of silly if you're trying to hold this suitcase, which is supposed to look like you have some clothes in it, and it's taking all your strength to hold the thing up. And a number of uh, the uh, clandestine operators were caught because the suitcase was so heavy, they were being pulled over to about a 40 pound suitcase by the time you get that that big transformer in there. Here's a guy who put it on the back of his bicycle. He had an easier time uh, pedaling it around, but you could see it just looks like a normal suitcase on the back of the bike. Uh, a couple of more pianists in action here and uh, some more spy radio operators. And we take a look at the radio sets themselves. They're very well described in a wonderful book by Louis Milstey and uh, Rudy Starlitz. Uh, called Clandestine Radio, Wireless for the Warrior. Very expensive book, each, each uh, uh, volume is about 60 bucks, but uh, volume four is all about clandestine radios. And they came in all sorts of different shapes. This is the uh, one of the clandestine British radios. Uh, this is the same radio basically set up to be dropped by parachute. And you'll notice the tubes are taken out so they won't be broken during the, um, the parachute drop and then they can be plugged in. This is the famous, um, one of the most famous of the uh, spy radio sets called a B2. And it was designed by John Brown, G3 -E EUR. So a ham uh, designed this, the transmitters in back with plug-in coils, the receivers in the front and the power supply, which is the really heavy thing with all the various jumpers to select different voltages is over on the right. Uh, here's another clandestine spy radio. And if I had time, I'm, normally when I give this talk, I break out and show one of these radios, this one specifically in action. And I put it on the air and uh, you can hear it on the radio, but I'm not gonna do that tonight because it takes uh, extra time and I know we're running short. I'm sorry that it, uh, it's such a long talk. Uh, the radios themselves are very, very straightforward. You have a typical receiver with a 455 KC IF and a BFO over here to inject the um, signal in to allow you to copy CW. Um, there's a 6V6 crystal oscillator on the left, 6L6 final amplifier, and here's that big heavy power transformer with all the various windings on it. Um, just a very, very straightforward radio circuit as you would expect to see in those days. Here's another radio uh, called the SST1 uh, designed so it could actually fit inside a freshly baked piece of French bread that you see up top there. And again, the components are by no means miniature, but the overall size of the thing was small enough to fit inside the bread. And these radios were set up wherever they could be set up. Here's that radio being set up in the field. And here it is being carried around in a suitcase. So quite versatile in terms of those things. Here's a RS1 GRC 109, a more somewhat more recent radio set. And uh, here is yours truly with a World War II walkie talkie on the right side there. And the absolute latest of uh, uh, in, in ciphered radios in on the left side of the picture, just for comparison. Um, and uh, Mr. Mike, the a man who runs the Nearfest Hamfest, put together this wonderful little chart. And if you do a screen save off here, you can have this. It shows the designations of uh, surplus radio sets and what they mean. And SCR followed by numbers is a set complete radio and BC followed by a number would be a basic component. So if you see BC in front of a number, you see that that is a basic component of a radio system. In late World War II, they used the PRC designations and in the 1950s, TRC, GRC, VRC, and SYNC cars 
were the designations for radios. Just handy if you happen to see one at a ham fest or if you're into um, surplus radios. Here's another radio, didn't get very far. It was a, a, a trial, uh, they were uh, set up to use it as a, a, a water carried radio. A scuba diver would uh, go down with this thing on their back and surface and uh, whip up a whip antenna. And uh, that was, it, it was a total failure. I won't bother, go bother. Uh, here's an interesting one, a doggy radio. Uh, you can see that the dog is set up with a radio receiver and transmitter, and uh, the dog has an earphone, and you can see the microphone in the dog's uh, mouth so it can talk to its uh, trainer there and tell him what's going on. I'm just kidding about that, by the way, in case you hadn't caught on. This is a, the dog just has a receiver, and the, the trainer can talk to the dog by microphone. These things actually did use service, uh, did see service during the war. So here is a typical spy headquarters. This one is in Bergen in Norway. I went to visit it and you can see all the things we've been talking about. We got a suitcase radio up here, a helicopter's receiving a loudspeaker, a big huge ferry act that you see in the back wall there to control the transmitter receiver over here. And uh, most of this room uh, was very highly um, classified. They didn't want it to be found. So the door was set up so that if you open the door improperly, the TNT um, bomb in the room would blow up the bomb. The door itself was kind of interesting. This is the back of the door. You can see a little motor in the middle there that was designed to pull the latch out of the door. And if you tried to break down, break the door down, you would break this circuit and the bomb would go off. The only way you could open the door would be to connect two innocent looking nails together using a piece of wire. And if you connected the correct nails together, the motor would pull back the, uh, the catch on the door and the door would open. So all kinds of spy stuff going on during the war. Direction finding devices, of course, were used to track down these guys. Here's a German direction finding van. You can see the antenna on top of the van. And here are some other direction finding vehicles used by the Germans during the war. Sometimes the antennas were even able to be hidden inside the vehicle as in this convertible Mercedes on the right with the direction finding radio inside. The uh, direction finding vans of course had people manually rotating the loops and locating the spy radios in that way. Uh, there were also direction finding antennas on aircraft. This is the famous Feisler Storch, which could fly almost, you could, you could almost uh, fly slowly enough so a person could run alongside. Those huge wings allowed it to be an excellent observation plane, very maneuverable and very good for spotting people uh, who, who might be transmitting in the woods. Here's a suitcase direction finder. Um, if you didn't want to be seen with a vehicle, you could carry this thing around and locate the station by rotating your hand and the directional antenna within the suitcase. Here's a Gestapo agent with a direction finding receiver hidden on his body. We call these body worn direction finders. He looks fairly innocent, although <laughs> with that outfit, he doesn't look too innocent. But if we do a flasher routine on him like that, you see that his, under his coat, he has a radio receiver. That's a, about a six tube radio receiver with the batteries all strapped to his way to his uh, body there and uh, out in his arms are where the antenna is located. And what he does is he walks along looking quite innocently like this and occasionally he glances down at his wristwatch. And the wristwatch happens to be a signal strength meter, even though it looks like a wristwatch. And uh, he can use that to find a null. And when he finds a null, he knows that the plane 
of the line between his two shoulders is in line with the uh, spy radio, the, the radio transmitter, the, the um, pianist that, that he's trying to catch. So it was quite uh, clever to hide these things. And once you had come into the general location of a radio transmitter by using a truck, you could then send a person uh, in to find the transmitter using a body-worn direction finder such as that. One of the ways of getting around that was to make your transmissions really, really short. And this is a wonderful burst encoder for use by spies who didn't know the Morse code. And of course, any radio operators would know the Morse code, but every once in a while you had a spy that really couldn't send Morse code very fast. And this thing is capable of sending Morse code extremely rapidly. You take that little stylus in the bottom there and you look along the top there, you'll see various letters. And if you move the stylus down, it makes contact with the little brass contacts uh, under each letter. If you go way over on the left, you can see the dot dash for the letter A and the next one uh, dash dot 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 for B and so on. So a clever little device used for sending extremely rapidly in very short bursts that hopefully couldn't be uh, zeroed in on by manually operated direction finding antennas. And ciphered messages were also used. Uh, spies never had Enigma machines. They had to use other enciphering techniques. And here's a typical enciphered message enciphered by hand. And uh, sometimes the enciphered messages were left in dead drops uh, inside a walnut or hidden in some other way. The Enigma machines, which of course is what I'm primarily fascinated by and been collecting for 40 years, um, were used by the spy controllers, the guys who told the spies what to do. And they thought they were really clever. They would uh, communicate with each other and say, well, I'm gonna send my spy over here and you're gonna spend, you send your spy over there. And the allies, thanks to the work of the Polish uh, mathematicians who taught the British how to break the Enigma code, uh, the, the British were able to tune in on these messages and locate spies in that way. And it is calculated that just about every German spy that found his way into, and I should say his or her way into England, was caught. And because of the decoding of the Enigma coded messages. And that's another talk. If you ever want me to come back after this, I'll give you a talk on the enigmas. Here's a uh, inside a, a ship uh, using direction finding antennas to get gross locations of where transmitters are. Here's a, uh, a guy who was caught. This guy on the right uh, was uh, caught by the, uh, enigma coded messages and eventually by being zeroed in on. When a spy was caught in England, he'd given two choices. You can either come work for us and send false messages back to your handlers or we'll kill you. <laughs> Not much of a choice, but he decided to become a double agent. This is his code wheel on the left. And uh, it was uh, uh, typical to find these guys. Here's a spy radio station that's set up to look like a ham radio station located in New York City. And this guy on the left uh, had a full, fully appropriate ham radio license and uh, helicrafters, receivers and all. He was just embedding secret messages to Germany inside his messages on ham radio. And of course, hams were eventually prohibited from being on the air at all during the war to prevent things like this from happening. This guy was caught because his neighbors turned him in and uh, uh, they... Um, caused the FBI to start looking for him. And his transmitting headquarters were way up on top of this building in New York City. At the end of the war, all the citizens in France were gradually given back their radios. And they were happy about that. And they were now able to listen to whatever radio stations they wanted to. Um, I'm going to go on, if it's OK, uh, and just tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the more recent kinds of bugs. I think, uh, uh, can someone say yes or no? I can't hear. Go ahead. Sure. Somebody, president, make a decision. I could stop here or give you another five or six minutes. Go for it. You're, okay. you're all good. Yep. Okay, okay, here we go. Uh, this is a, a talk 
that follows up on the spy radio talk uh, on the use of CIA bugs uh, during the Cold War. It was put together by Paul Rovers and Mark Simons in the Netherlands, and they let me use most of their uh, material. It's really a fascinating story. Um, of course, hidden microphones inside wristwatches were commonly used by spies. Uh, hidden microphones inside neckties with a radio transmitter that would transmit over to a, um, a separate receiver were quite common. The problem with these, of course, were that they required batteries. And uh, here's a CIA bug built into a fountain pen. And you can see over on the left is the battery. And they, obviously this thing's not gonna work forever. The battery is going to run out after a while, but it's, you can see how the components were miniaturized compared to what I showed you during World War II. You have a microphone, a bunch of three discrete transistors, and over on the right is a little coil that serves as the antenna. And of course, this is a Cold War 1960s design. Nowadays, it would be surface mount transistors and, and circuits, so much, much, much smaller. Um, here is a typical KGB bug used in the 1960s by the KGB, the Russian secret um, equivalent to the FBI. Uh, you can see the size in the lower illustration here. You can see the simplicity of this bug. It's incredible. The uh, crystal microphone here actually directly tunes the coil that is oscillating in the transmitter. So it, it, the crystal microphone is frequency modulating the coil and then it's transmitted to a receiver. Very, very simple circuit, very um, interesting to see. Uh, bugs were built into such things as IBM selectric typewriters where power wasn't a problem, they're plugged in. And this little strip that you see in the lower part of the picture is a bug that was built into a selectric typewriter. Here's a device that was put into people's homes in Germany. The uh, telephone repairman would show up and say, you're having a problem with your phone line. I'm going to put a signal conditioning a box in there and your phone will be much better than it was. And the signal conditioning box is uh, here. It actually says conditional sig signaling box and sensor. But inside, if you look carefully, you can see a transistor and IC and two big condensers that make the that tap into the phone line. But when you look at the phone line electrically, you can't see that they're, that it's being tapped into because you're only tapping in by way of a condenser. There's no load on the on the phone line, no DC load. Here's a, a chart that shows all kinds of different typical bugs that were used during the Cold War. The bugs were detected by various devices, uh, sim somewhat similar to the body-worn direction finder that we were talking about in World War II. This is a Tesla MRP4 bug detector, and it has two antennas, a small antenna and a large antenna, very simple circuit, um, large antenna for the lower frequency band. And it feeds the antenna directly into a couple of diodes. The diodes are fed into an amplifier and the amplifier is fed, fed into either loudspeaker or earphones or a visual indicator. Very, very simple, but very effective. You walk into a room where there's a bug and uh, the meter starts indicating. You walk around in the room and find where the maximum indication is and you find the bug. Here's a, a really sneaky looking guy with one of these Teslas under his jacket. And here he is doing the flash act, uh, showing how the Tesla receiver is worn under your jacket to find bugs. Uh, another typical bug detector being used by this sneaky looking guy. And uh, another problem that people ran into, every time you have a development of one kind, then you have a counter development. And so the people uh, decided that they would uh, jam a room to prevent any possibility that a bug in the room, room might be able to transmit signals out of the room. So they put a strong jamming signal into a room thinking that that would block any possibility of an enemy bug getting a signal out of the room uh, because it covers all frequencies. 
And to overcome that, you use a differential bug detector, which is a little receiver that is set up so that any signal that comes into both of the antennas simultaneously is canceled out. That's what a differential uh, circuit does. But any signal that comes in differentially between more between one of the antennas than the other is amplified. So you can actually use this device to detect the modulation on the bug within a room like that. Uh, the CIA also experimented with a drone uh, that was built so small that it looked from a distance as though it was a um, dragonfly. And this was in the 1970s. And they flew this thing around in rooms and uh, the microphones out in the tail, as you can see, but it was, uh, it was fairly effective, but the darn thing made a lot of noise. And so it wasn't quite like you'd expect uh, with, a, with a, uh, a, a real bug. So the CIA got to thinking and finally, believe it or not, they actually decided to use a real dragonfly. And here you see a dragonfly outfitted with a micro transmitter and a microphone. And they flew this thing around. This is really recent uh, stuff. This is in 2017. They had this little guy flying around. So <laughs> they didn't give up on the bugs even as late as three or four years ago. Um, how it all started, the real, real interesting stuff from the standpoint of people following the technology was when the Russians donated a beautiful carved version of the United States Great Seal. Um, and uh, it was donated to the building which we built in, um, uh, in Moscow, which was the United States Embassy. Uh, the Russians said, we want you to have this as a symbol of our appreciation of your help during World War II, blah, blah, blah. And the, uh, the idiots in the embassy put this thing up on the wall uh, in 1945. And it wasn't until, believe it or not, 1952 that they discovered that there was a bug inside this thing. And the reason they didn't think it, there was a bug in there is that they swept the room and there was no obvious signal coming in from anything in the room. And also uh, the thing stayed on the wall for uh, five, six, seven years. So it's unlikely that any battery could have lasted that long. But sure enough, inside this seal was a bug. And it wasn't a normal bug. It was just a little piece of wire and a little round thing. Didn't look like any bug that ever been seen before. So the bug was found in 1952 and the CIA was so embarrassed that they didn't reveal it until 1960. They, there was no public acknowledgement of this. So how can you possibly have a piece of wire inside something becoming a bug? And I think that's the most interesting part of what I'm going to say, the technology here. The way it works is that this piece of wire uh, is indeed the antenna, but the antenna itself simply connects to a metal plate, of one, one of the electrodes of a capacitor, one of the plates of a capacitor. And in this little circular thing is basically a capacitor microphone with a very thin metal membrane that picked up audio and vibrated back and forth and therefore changed the capacitive loading of this little one of the, the parts of the capacitor inside the circle here. And that of course was connected to the antenna. Now, as, as a device, it's certainly not radiating anything here. It's just here a, a passive device. And down in the illustration below, you can see how the antenna is coupled to the capacitive plate capacitively. And the microphone, the, the um, uh, membrane over here is vibrating back and forth. The trick is that this thing has to be excited by an external signal. So you take a transmitter and you transmit a signal at this bug and it, it uh, vibrates or causes the antenna to uh, resonate in frequency with the implied energy. 
the resonating antenna then, the frequency of the resonating antenna is slightly modified by the capacitive loading with the microphone and the microphone element. And this difference, the slight, slight difference between the transmitted and the received um, signal allows you to decode and decipher the auditory intelligence that's being picked up by the microphone. Over here is a little more uh, advanced version of the circuit in which you have the antenna element, um, a dipole with a diode between, and then the diode feeds into a little three-stage solid state amplifier and a microphone, and the diode also powers the, um, the uh, amplifier here. So it provides power uh, to amplify the microphone signal, just a slightly improved version of what we saw before. before. And here's a, a circuit diagram of it. <clears throat> um, in an operation called Easy Chair, the, uh, uh, the allies, the Americans actually, tried to get back at the Russians by bugging the Russian embassy in The Hague in 1958. After they, remember they discovered this thing in 52, they had time to, to work out the technology and they tried to bug the Russian embassy, Russian embassy over here on the left, they were trying to bug it from this building on the right. And the, uh, the room which they were bugging was right in here. And the bug was actually built into the leg of a polished mahogany desk. And the Russians would have been too suspicious if the Americans had given them a desk. So uh, they bought a desk, but the Americans got into the company that made the desk and they said, hey, we need to drill a hole in one of the legs here and, and put our little uh, wire down into that leg. And somehow they got away with getting this thing inside the embassy. And again, this is a, a passive device, no battery here no oscillator, it's just sitting there, a piece of wire uh, with a little uh, uh, capacitive microphone up at the top, ready to pick up the signal. Here we have the, uh, the uh, Russian embassy on the right, and 125 meters away is the place where the transmitter is located that's going to bug the Russian embassy. And here's a picture of the window where the transmitter is located and a little staircase that's going up to the room where the transmitter is located that activates the bug. And again, the view out of the window and uh, the view of the Russian embassy. And you'll notice that the amount of power that was pumped out to, to uh, activate the bug uh, was 500 watts plus 14 dBs uh, due to the high gain antenna that was used. So that bug was being irradiated by 10 kW, uh, 10 kilowatts of RF energy. And you can imagine that the people in the room were going to feel something after a while. And if you remember some of the things that were going on in the Cuban embassy, where some of our uh, diplomats were experiencing headaches and all kinds of strange symptoms, well, it's quite likely that they were being irradiated by something of this nature. And this is the technology then behind those stories that you may have read about how the, um, uh, how the um, uh, diplomats were uh, developing strange illnesses. That's a lot of power to be subjected to. Um, and uh, again, uh, debilitating headaches, vertigo, nausea, memory loss, dizziness, tinnitus, and other symptoms. In 2020, just a year ago, the issue, of the 2020 issue of, of Science Magazine reported on the likelihood that pulsed high energy radio waves probably caused those symptoms. Now you and I know where those radio waves most likely came from. With that, I'll turn it back to you guys and uh, sorry to take so long, but I hope it was enjoyable and uh, stop my sh screen sharing here and hope you enjoyed that. Hey Tom, uh, this is Sid W2SID. And I, uh, I wanted, uh, I saw in some of your material where you had used the uh, material from the Crypto Museum in Annapolis and you might just want to tell that to the fellows that anybody is traveling in that area 
it's not open now because of COVID, but uh, a little a little story about the museum, a quick story might be interesting. Yeah, it's actually a different museum. So Yeah, I'll just clarify that. Cryptomuseum.com is my dear friends, Paul and Mark, who are in the Netherlands and who have the most extensive and wonderful website on enigmas and everything else you could ever imagine. You are talking about the wondrous NSA Museum just outside of Baltimore. And Correct. The place right. where you definitely want to go if you're anywhere near, even if you're visiting Washington, D.C., because they have wall to wall Enigma machines, all the stuff I've been talking about, all kinds of spy equipment. And uh, there is an Enigma machine that you can actually walk right up to and type on. So it's a fabulous, fabulous place. I have traded them a Russian uh, Fialka machine and others. And by the way, if any of you are uh, uh, watch uh, a TV program called The Blacklist, uh, the, the, uh, Friday, um, one of my Fialka machines was uh, shown on the Blacklist program with uh, my son sort of holding the hand of the guy who the great actor there and, and talking him through using this machine. So if you like that. Is that the Russian knot? That's it, the Russian knot. That's a Fialka. And if you come to my museum, which is enigmamuseum.com, or anywhere else you'll find uh, Paul and Mark's museum, you'll see a lot of information on that. You must have seen the episode. It was really silly episode, but boy, was it fun to have our machine uh, airing. And uh, one other comment, uh, one of my Enigma machines uh, went, uh, was the star of the Imitation Game movie, which you might have seen, uh, well, uh, well received movie. And the Enigma in there is one that I found and restored. Over and out. One of the things that I am cherishing is a, a gift that Tom gave me, which is a rotor from a Fialka machine, a spare rotor, uh, along with some other little items. And uh, as you might imagine, these types of encoding devices are becoming more and more difficult to get your hands on unless you have a lot of money. I think uh, and just this past week, an Enigma machine, uh, is it correct to say, Tom, that the price of $441,000? with the added fees is the highest that's ever been known to be paid for an Enigma? Yes, that's that's correct, Bob. $441,000 is what the uh, the buyer of this machine actually paid for. And it was a regular three rotor Enigma, just like the one you see. Over, over. And, and just to think 25, 30 years ago, when I first met Tom up at the Saratoga Ham Fest, I should have offered him $25,000 right there, and he probably would have taken it. <laughs> yeah, the price has sneaked its way up. I think the last Boston Spa, I had uh, a machine priced at $195,000, but uh, we've just uh, added $100,000 to the price. <laughs> So I hope you all enjoyed that uh, spy radio talk. And if any of you have spy radios that you've collected, uh, bring them over to the ham fest at some point and show them off. Uh, Bob and I are thinking of actually setting up a teletype machine there because uh, there aren't many hams nowadays who have even seen a teletype machine. And both Bob and I had a wonderful time in our earlier days with, uh, with model 19, model 15 teletypes. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody have any more Thank questions? Um, this is Ken K two U Y K. You're you're also involved in another th another uh, type of bug, CW bugs. And I just recommend anybody that's interested in Morse code keys really needs to go to Tom's website and check it out. It's a wealth of information, and the catalog is certainly. Uh, a, a valued treasure in in my collection, and I would recommend it highly. And and anybody that has the opportunity, if they do have the Saratoga Ham Fest this year, stop and say hi to Tom. It's really a a, a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. That was a lot of fun to put that book together. I put that book together because so many people. Uh, hams were dying and their wives would, would see this big pile of stuff and yeah. put it in the dumpster. And that book has a price guide of telegraph keys 
some telegraph keys like the one I just showed, which is very, very early pre-Civil War mm -hmm. uh, telegraph keys sell for 20,000 bucks. Wonderful. And, uh, you think of some yeah. poor family throwing that thing in the garbage because it's just an old piece yeah. of glass. That was what I wrote that book. Just, just to put a plug out, I have a friend up in, uh, up in New Brunswick who has a, uh, a collection of about 85 telegraph items that he's, uh, he's looking to sell. So if anybody is, is interested in key collecting, uh, that I think is a very nice collection uh, to get your hands on. I have no idea what he's asking for it. I just, uh, I just know he wants to part with it. So uh, he may have contacted you at some point uh, because I sent him your catalog, so. Okay, I haven't heard from him. If he, okay. wants, if he wants an appraisal, I'll be happy to do it for him. Here's a, a really exciting piece that I bought at the Saratoga Ham Fest one year. A little girl came up to me and she said, I have this thing on my bureau that was given to me and uh, I, I don't really want it. It's not very pretty, but I thought you might be interested in it. And I immediately recognize it as a Civil War spy telegraph set. And you could see the tiny little telegraph yeah. key yeah. in there and these two coils. And the way you use this thing is you take one of the terminals and you hook a wire to it and you throw it up over the enemy telegraph line. And those lines were never insulated during the Civil War. They had no insulation. You take the other wire to the other terminal and you jam it in the, into the end of your bayonet, tie it around the end of your <laughs> bayonet and jam that into the ground. And that makes the complete circuit. And you can then listen in to the enemy telegraph signals. Mm -hmm. And if you're good, you can send fake signals with the telegraph key to confuse the enemy. So she, she parted with this thing and it's been a prized possession of mine. Absolutely beautiful little wow. piece of uh, memorabilia of the Civil War. Uh, that, that's that's probably like the first bugging of the enemy, isn't it? That's it. Yeah, very <laughs> much like that. If the CIA was around, they would have had those then. They probably would have. <laughs> yeah, that, that's great. Thank you very much. I love the presentation on Enigma too. The the uh, the the concept of it is fascinating on uh, on how we got away with uh, intercepting the. And, and there's, there's another whole, uh, whole sideline with the Japanese side. And uh, we, uh, well, before NSA, but they, the, uh, the United States forces had a lot of women working on code breaking, uh, breaking the Japanese code. And there, there was a, a couple of television programs on that recently. So yeah, it, it, it's, really a, it's really a big, uh, a big effort. And CW is still alive. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Joe can attest, Mark can attest. Ken, Ken, was that the one they called Magic? Magic? That's purple. one of the codes. Purple. I think so. Purple. I don't remember. Purple or both? Purple. There's a big uh, uh, display of uh, uh, information at the Crypto Museum. Yes. The purple okay. code. Cryptomuseum.com. For those of you who are techies, and Tom will probably elaborate on this, but if you've seen an Enigma machine, either on the outside or with the cover open, you're probably aware that it, it appears to be an extremely complicated, at first glance, mechanical device, but as it does run off of power, it's an electrical device. Uh, any of you would hazard a guess as to the close, from an electrical circuit point of view, what an Enigma machine most closely is like, something that you all have in your home right now? Telephone? Mm -mm. Much simpler. Let me just uh, try and give you a hint. Uh, let me change over my video here a moment. Uh, take a second. Okay, let's see if we got it. Go into speaker view so you can see Tom's video uh, as large as you can, or. Thank you for reminding me. 
So I'll let you continue to think about a device you have in your home that is in effect the electric circuit of an Enigma machine. How do you have ideas? Coffee pot? <laughs> I'm sorry, what'd you say, JR? I said the coffee pot. <laughs> nope, simpler than, well, a coffee pot, but not quite the emulation. My toaster does a good job. Toaster. It's as simple as both of those, but it's even simpler still. I'll let Tom go ahead with his. Here goes the demonstration. This is a hint. So you push a button, and what do you see on the face of the machine? A light. So is that enough of a hint to what an Enigma machine is most like? A light switch. Light switch. You're close. A lamp. Portable. Well, a flashlight. flashlight. A flashlight. That's all it is. All it is is a flashlight on steroids. One battery, one switch, one bulb. <laughs> Tom? So, so now you know that the most expensive flashlight that's ever been sold was sold in the past week for $441,000. <laughs> So the circuit is extremely, extremely simple in its simplest form. You then have to multiply it by 26 times because there's a flashlight for each of the 26 letters in the alphabet, like the letter A, and there's the letter A light bulb, and there's a battery. So there's the flashlight for one of the letters in the alphabet, and you have 26 of those. So you have just 26 flashlights, that's pretty straightforward. But then things get excited and you realize that a number of things can be changed within the wiring of the thing that make each of those flashlights just a little bit different from each other. And when you go through all of the possible changes that can be made, it turns out that there are 10 to the 114th power possible settings of an Enigma machine. There are only 10 to the 80th power atoms in the entire observable universe. So that is one complex little flashlight. <laughs> the uh, Spy Museum in New York City had uh, an Enigma on display as well as a computer set up that was meant to crack it at the time, which is, I say computer in the loosest sense, but uh, basically, motorized wheels that were trying the different combinations until they would get the light to go on. Yeah, you should see. Uh, they also know, have the, uh, the Russian knot, <laughs> uh, one of my Fialka machines on display there. I sold them a lot of equipment, a uh, number of spy radios. Uh, the, if you remember the Enigma that was blown up, there were just pieces of it all in one display case. That was one of the enigmas that uh, we bought from a battlefield in Germany that was really blown up. And they, they did the most beautiful job of displaying it. Yep. Mark, so, the machine that you're referring to is called the BOMB, B-O-M-B-E. Correct. Um, you can get a, a sense of that if you watch the imitation game. Um, <laughs> it's, an, it's a good movie. Um, it's really not particularly accurate. You know, I would say less than 50% accurate by most analysis, but it gives you a really good sense of the mechanism that was used. The one inexcusable inaccuracy is that uh, Alan Turing was credited for having the Enigma and designed the Bomba when actually um, three brilliant Polish mathematicians not only cracked the Enigma and designed the Bomba, but they did it six years before Alan Turing had anything to do with the Enigma. And they eventually gave him the information on how to go about it. He never <laughs> gave them any credit at all. So was, was the movie, was that movie about Alan Turing really just baloney because the Poles had already cracked the uh, uh, device? Yes, it was baloney on that aspect, but on many of the other aspects, it was correct. He, uh, he did wonderful things, and he was involved there, a, a very important guy. It's just, unfortunately, he didn't bother the movie director, even though we tried to get the director to 
to uh, talk about the polls. I said, I want to talk about uh, Alan Turing and his, his sexual problems. <laughs> they thought that would sell the movie better. Yeah. So that was unfortunate. Now, even that was distorted. There is a large group of people who do not believe that Alan Turing committed suicide by eating that apple. The coroner never uh, investigated whether the apple had any poison in it. And uh, there are a number of much more compelling theories of why Alan Turing died, including a mistake that he made while experimenting with cyanide. Mm. He was known to have been very, very happy and involved in projects that he was doing at, on the day, the very day before he committed suicide. And generally, people who are about to commit suicide are not happy and outgoing and so on there there I would say most of them are not <laughs> but his one of, I think it's his nephew had a uh, had some sort of a uh, a program on uh public television uh regarding uh his uncle's uh efforts to break the uh, German codes so there's a there's a lot of interest there but it's always been a it's always uh, been disturbing to me that if the polls had really broken that six years before, why didn't they receive the credit for that? And uh, why why did they go to so much effort to publish everything about Alan Turing? Because the British really love, if you look at the history of the British, they love to um, ex, 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 exaltate their achievements and they don't typically give credit to other people. It's just a, a classical thing, and uh, sure. Turing did such great work, it's unfortunate that it even has to be involved in this controversy. Mm -hmm. He should get all the credit he can possibly get, mm -hmm. because he, he did amazing things. He took the Polish inventions, and he then built that additional machine that allowed them to crack the submarine enigma, which is a four-rotor enigma, not a three-rotor enigma. And without that, the submarines could have sunk all the ships coming to England. We could have lost the war. There are some people who argue, and, and legitimately so, that breaking of enigma and related that of purple and other Japanese encoded machines were, in fact, the factors that were the most influential in the outcome of the war. That without that information and intelligence and oh. some decisions that were made about that, um, you know, uh, it, it, it could have gone a different way. There are a lot of phenomenal people in this. Uh, the imitation game, you probably can't find online unless you have a service uh, where you get movies or you buy the DVD. But I just, on a related thing, if you're interested, there's a very famous couple, William Friedman and Elizabeth Smith Friedman, who were involved with code breaking at Bletchley Park. And uh, a phenomenal book was written about Elizabeth Friedman and in particularly all the women involved in this particular venture. And that movie was, uh, was produced by PBS. And as a result, it's online. So if you go to pbs.org and look for a movie called, it was part of the American Experience series. It's called The Code Breaker. And uh, it, that's, it, it's, it's an hour long and it gives you a tremendous insight into uh, the depth and breadth of that element of it. And particularly the large number of women who worked in code breaking throughout the world but certainly in the UK, so. Well, Bob, there's the imitation game. That's a movie or a book? It's a movie. Okay. Only a movie. Yeah, okay. it's definitely worth seeing. It's a, it's a well-made movie, but to Tom's point, it's unfortunately not ac as accurate in history. And as I, I've had a similar experience in having been involved in another motion picture, where the facts be damned, the producers want to dwell on the human interest part of it. And if there's not a lot of legitimate human interest, they tend to take some license and make it up. So there are two fundamental questions here. What actually happened with the result of, of Turing's work and how the code was broken. And to this point, the very ignored 
young Polish mathematicians, and I've got a ton of information on them. They were fascinating young men. And then the second element is, is making Alan Turing into maybe somebody who he really wasn't. And Dermot uh, Turing is his nephew that you were referring to, Ken, and he lectures. He's written several books uh, about his, his uncle and tries to set the record straight. Irregardless, it certainly is interesting to listen to uh, that experience. And uh, the other thing with, with the, uh, the women on the, uh, on the uh, Pacific side, uh, none of them were um, members of the armed forces. And uh, they tried to join the armed forces, but the I believe the government wouldn't let them. So they were actually civilians working on, as far as I understand, working on uh, trying to break the, uh, the Japanese codes. And uh, there, there was quite a, a PBS uh, program on that, I think about a year and a half ago. And somewhere I've got the information written down, but right now I can't, it, ex it escapes me, but it's, it's certainly an interesting topic to go along with the war in the, uh, in the uh, Atlantic, the European theater. So very good, very good, Tom. Thanks, Ken. Kudos to you. I'll see you in Boston Spa. You bet you will. <laughs> How about um, the... Tom is trying to talk me into digging my my all of my unbelievably heavy teletype equipment out, so we would set up a a teletype at a table in one of the pavilions. But boy, that's that'll be an effort. But again, at this point, uh, Tom, to my latest knowledge, unless some of you on on this know differently, I don't know that the Saratoga County or the Saratoga club has yet made a decision um, for having a ham fest in September. So. I'd love to know as soon as somebody finds out. Yep. Well, we're monitoring that. Foxborough, which is usually the day before is going to be held, but it's a different date, I believe than, than usual. Mm -hmm. And of course, near fest, uh, we're really looking forward to the October 14, 15 near fest. Can I interrupt for a moment? Hello. Hello. My name again is Ridge, David Twitch, if you all. The East Green Bush Amateur Radio Association is having their ham fest, which has up been very popular. I don't know what we're up for our 10th year or something, on August 21st. Yeah, we, we had announced that earlier in the uh, in the meeting. Oh, my apology. My no, apologies. no problem. Just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. you know, that didn't come I'm sorry. My apologies. Very well. No, no Thank problem. You. Thank you. Duplication's good for some of us with limited memories. <laughs> <laughs> when is uh, Boxborough? Did, did I hear something about Boxborough? Boxborough is going to be held at a different on a different date. I don't know the date yet, but you can probably find it easily. Okay. Thank you. Mike and I usually give a talk at Boxborough, and I think we're going to do that this time. Mike's going to try something very interesting and different at uh, Nearfest. Uh, we're going to try and do a hybrid ham fest in which not only uh, is the ham fest being held in person, but we're going to have Wi-Fi on the grounds, the whole fairgrounds there, and people walking around with... Uh, their uh, smartphones uh, videoing and talking to people at the table. You, make, you reach the point where you can actually buy something uh, over the internet. We did that with, I don't know whether any of you know about the New England Vintage Radio Club, NEVAC. Uh, we did that successfully with the NEVAC Club, ran a hand test virtually. If you listen on 3880, uh, the AM guys will be talking about Boxborough when it starts to get closer, so. What are you doing on AM? I'm not. I just listen. <laughs> 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 I don't have a microphone, Joe. <laughs> okay. People just checking. Defending CW. Oh, dear. Just checking. Leave me alone, will you? <laughs> So, so Tom, one of, the, one of the elements of your, your presentation should give all these, these gentlemen an inspiration, which is instead of walking around with those big, huge, bulky HTs, just build something into your dentures. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, that would be good. Your dentist Ouch. would love that. Ouch. <laughs> 
That would yeah. be like mental telepathy, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, you've certainly all been walking down the street and you see you come across somebody who's having a very animated conversation and there's not a human being within 20 feet of them. And of course, they're on their you know, their cell phone and using a very nondescript, um, you know, jaw modulated kind of microphone and earpiece. So it's yeah. it's not uncommon now for not Keep, now, but a couple of years ago, you'd think they were nuts. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I lament this because going through New York City, you can't tell the crazies from the people on their cell phones. <laughs> well, <coughs> I wonder if anybody's lost a filling because of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the key to a good high gain antenna is your fillings. Yeah. Yeah. What was what was the.